Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Saddleback webinar this week. I'm Liz Mangus, Literacy Specialist with Saddleback Educational Publishing, and we are thrilled to bring you this highly requested webinar on a topic that many of you have you've written into us and you've said, hey, we, we haven't heard about, uh, about our students yet, and we want you to talk about our students. So we're finally here to talk about long-term English learners with Beth Skelton. Um, we'll also talk about that phrase, long-term English learners as well. I know some of you had some questions about that. Uh, we'll get started right at three o'clock Eastern time. As usual, please locate your control bar, which is on the bottom of your web browser window. That is where you will find the chat, the Q&A, and the live transcript um, icon. So the chat is going to be how you will interact with us today. I, we love it when you interact with us today. So uh, any day, really, any webinar, we, we really need that energy of you participating in the chat. So please feel free. Just make sure that you choose panelists and attendees before you hit send on your chat. That will allow everybody who's participating today to see what you have to say. The Q&A area is for your questions, so please drop any questions there, either for Saddleback or for Beth today. And if you'd like to take advantage of our subtitles, go ahead and click on that live transcript option and then select show subtitles. We will get started in just a couple minutes. Here's where you can find us on Twitter. So Saddleback and Beth, we're both on Twitter. Uh, go there right now, let everybody know you're joining us for this great learning opportunity. And if you happen to catch the recording, you can still tweet about us. Go ahead, mention us, let everybody know that you uh, are here to learn. And if something really catches your eye and something really resonates with you, go ahead and take that screenshot, screenshot and post it on Twitter. We always love to, to have that feedback and interaction with you on Twitter. So I think we have a couple more minutes. Uh, we have about one more minute, Beth. So how are you, Beth? I'm great, and I'm so excited to see everyone here. We've got um, some folks from Ecuador and Spain, Texas right. and Florida, Colorado friends are in the house. I'm just thrilled to see this. Oh, Denmark's in the house. Hi, Meta. Um, and then, of course, local Montrose, Colorado. That's right on my side of the state of Colorado, where I'm from. Chicago's in the house. This is so exciting. Um, welcome, Solange from- Hi, Solange. <laughs> our webinar presenter, Solange has been on our webinar series as well. So, I mean, that's what I love about our webinar series is it's such a great welcoming crowd and everybody's so supportive and uh, eager to learn. And it's just, it's so uplifting. And I just want to thank you all for attending and look at everybody they know how to use the chat a one one full year of living their life on zoom everybody knows how to choose panelists and attendees oh jody's here too hey jody yeah another one of your presenters awesome. really exciting um this, this has is been great. such an amazing series and to get prepared for this i spent a lot of time watching all of my predecessors <laughs> so i know i have a lot of a hard act to follow Oh, uh, this is going to be great. This, as I said, this has been a highly requested topic, and I think you're the perfect presenter for it. So um, I think it's just about time. It's just about three o'clock. Yes, it's three o'clock Eastern time. So you know what that means, everybody. Time to officially launch. Our topic today is working with long-term English learners. Um, Normally, I will do uh, an introduction and read a biography of our presenter today. I'm not going to do that. Uh, Beth is going to introduce herself as part of her presentation, um, which is very exciting. And also, we, I do want everybody to know that we are going to talk about the term long-term English learners as well. Some of you have um, written in questions about, uh, about that particular label, if you want to call it that, and we will most certainly address that. So I think that just about covers it. We're ready to go. Um, Beth, go ahead and take it away. Thanks so much, Liz. And again, welcome to everyone from all over the world. It's really, really exciting to be with you here today. And as Liz said, I will introduce myself. I am a, currently I'm a presenter, coach, and consultant with over 30 years of experience working with multilingual learners and their educators. I am currently focused on helping 
um, schools, school systems, and districts create equitable educational opportunities for our multilingual learners. I have worked in uh, 17 different countries, um, working with international schools and about 37 different states in that job. But I come to you from Western Colorado. So I get to live in paradise and work all over the world where there are many other paradises. Um, but I started out myself as a German language learner. I majored in German from Colorado Colorado College, which makes me a long-term German learner. I went on and got my master's in teaching English to speakers of other languages and along the way attempted to learn Spanish in Ecuador. Shout out to Ecuador. I was in Quito um, learning Spanish, which makes me a long-term learner of Spanish as well. I have published some materials for adult language learners who are new to the United States and need support with like the basics of ordering in a restaurant, um, making a doctor's appointment, getting an apartment, that kind of thing. And I used a story-based curriculum for adult language learners. And over the years, I have taught pre-K through adult multilingual learners. And the majority of my time in the classroom was in sixth through 12th grade, working with those language learners that we now call long-term English learners. I've also worked with newcomers and students in between, um, but that was a, a big percentage of the students that I worked with. The reason that I wanted to do my own introduction is simply because what I just modeled is a strategy that I would encourage you to use in your own classrooms and encourage your content teachers to use as well. And that is a visual introduction strategy. So let's transfer that to a content class. If you have a, if you're a social studies teacher or you work with a social studies teacher, they may be discussing the historic movements um, across the times and maybe they're going to start start with a movement picture from this past summer. And then they'll have the students talk about what they know about this already, what their questions are. So the launch is visual into our topic. In science, you might just present this trophic cascade picture or a food web with the arrows and the labels of the animals and just see what the students can already figure out before the whole lesson just using the visual. If you're starting a new book in English language arts, one I'd highly recommend, Efren Divided, you might just spend some time on the cover, fascinating cover in itself, where you see the picture of the boy has a shadow with two in his shadow. So what is that all about? And just discussing that before you ever open the book at all. And in math, maybe you're presenting a graph and having the students see what can they already learn just from the graph itself. By the way, this graph does come from um, Arizona State Department of Education and it shows that um, long term English learners in 2014 in Arizona had a lower graduation rate than newcomers. So that was a while ago, but um, it's that kind of data that we're starting to see across the states and what does that mean for our long term English learners. So that's a visual introduction strategy. You'll see me model strategies throughout and I just wanted to point that out that um, intros can do that as well. Our content objectives for our 45 minutes here together today are um, to understand who is classified as a long-term English learner and to address that label of long-term English learner as well. This is also our agenda. And then we're going to apply the ABCs of working with long-term English learners in a face-to-face -face or a virtual classroom. I know we have people in from all over the world. I've been in touch with my colleagues in some of those 17 different countries. And I know that different places in the world are still in distance learning mode. And my heart goes out to you, hang in there. Um, this has been such a hard year. But of course we have language objectives as well as a language uh, session. We are going to be describing the characteristics of long-term English learners. You'll be adding adjectives to the chat box, and then you'll be asking and answering questions both about text and about the content in here. So get your typing fingers ready. We will be using chat throughout the session. And there will be times for questions breaking up. Liz is monitoring that chat for me as I go to make sure I um, address the questions that come up. 
So let's go ahead and start with who is classified as a long-term English learner. Now, I am using information from the United States, but I, and so I don't know Ecuador, Denmark, Spain. I'm not sure how or if you have a definition that is different than this. We in the United States, every state can have a different definition and some states have already created one. My state of Colorado does not yet have a definition. So I'm going to um, give you what the Every Student Succeeds Act has given as the only official definition that this term has even been kind of mentioned in. And this is from 2015, the Every Student Succeeds Act. I'm gonna show it to you and give quiet time just to read this definition of who is classified as long-term. So there's a lot of words in there and there are a few really key items. So if you're in from an international system, um, you may or may not have an English language proficiency assessment that you're using. In the United States, we have several coalitions or um, organizations like WIDA or ELPA 21 that have a language proficiency assessment. And then each state sets what their cutoff is for exiting a program. So in my state of Colorado, we use the WIDA assessment called the ACCESS, and our students only have to be a four in literacy and overall with a body of evidence in order to exit the um, exit the program called English language um, proficiency or acquisition. But that changes state to state. So the definition itself varies wherever you are in the world or in the United States. If you had to tell someone in very few words, who is classified as a long-term English learner based on this definition, very much shorten it to three to five words. Who is in that classification? Go ahead and type that in the chat. How could you shorten that definition? Yep, yep, yep. Nice, Efren. Thank you for putting that in the chat. So I'm seeing that um, most people are saying it is six or more years because if they have to reclassify within five, that's right. And if you'll notice in the chat, this is also fascinating. So we have um, from Illinois is 4.8 to exit. In some states in the United States, they're at, at a five to exit. So if they moved to Colorado, they'd exit. You know, they wouldn't be considered a long-term English learner, but if my students who exited went somewhere else, they might be considered. So that is an issue with what we're dealing with now as well with this classification. So I um, absolutely agree with Rocio and I think I saw right away um, there were some people saying in an EL program for six or more years. That's how I would shorten it. Nice job. And Karen, thanks from Rhode Island. So these students, we have recently been seeing them as a subgroup of English language learners. And as with any group of language learners, whether we're talking newcomers, under newcomers, you have students with interrupted formal education um, and you have highly educated newcomers who are on grade level in their own language and literate and all of that. So you have all of these different subgroups and characteristics. So there are some characteristics that come to mind when we see this label. And I'd like to have you put in the chat, but don't hit return yet. We're gonna do a chat blast on this one. This is where you're gonna type your words and phrases to describe those long-term English learners. Put them in the chat, those phrases and words. Don't hit return yet. Let's let everyone in the session have a chance to go ahead and type before um, we hit return. And if you're typing now, that's great. Go ahead and finish up your word or phrase. I'm gonna count down to one from three. And on one, go ahead and hit return and let's have a blast. Three, two, one, go. Here they come. All right. 
go ahead and start scrolling and see what you see. This is great. These are words that I am never going to put on my screen, many of them. Some you're going to see. But that word struggling comes through a lot um, as I'm scrolling. Poor performance, struggles, low. Um, I love the term resilient, by the way, that's coming through. Slow, low, struggling. Um, social language, fluent and social language, that is one that often is. Um, brought up over and over can't meet proficiency strong oracy yep unmotivated interesting so um yeah frustrated uh struggling coming through again stuck flat line oh boy right notice the words and this is not critique to anyone who typed it i know that you are doing this because this is what we think of or your colleagues think of these are the words you hear with that label at the end of the session, we're gonna come back to this label and those words and how the two seem to be glued together and what that does for our students. Instead, I am gonna reframe. And the only thing you're gonna see on my slides and anything printed from me is gonna be asset-based. Because our students that are, character, are, are classified as long-term English language learners, we know that they have been in our systems for five or more years that they are automatically they come with a lot of assets because of that ability and being here that long, right? So our long-term asset-based characteristics, what we can say and what all the research on this subgroup of students shows is that they're almost all bilingual or multilingual. Now, when I say almost all, there are some long-term English learners who started school in kindergarten in our systems when their parents were speaking to them in another language. So they filled out that form um, at the school that said that they speak another language at home. But over time, that student started speaking only English. The parents started to switch because they've been here for now five, eight, 10 years. And now the student actually doesn't speak the home language anymore. Um, so they're not actually bilingual anymore. And I, I had a heartbreaking student just ask me the other day, I was working with an eighth grade student classified as an English language learner at kindergarten in our system in Colorado, now in eighth grade. And she asked me, Miss, do you think I can learn Spanish in high school? Oh, when one of her parents is a home language Spanish speaker who no longer speaks in Spanish at home because the children don't. So that's, that's one piece, but most of them are bilingual or multicultural. I would say that all of them are bicultural or multicultural. And because of that, this actual asset, this is a huge asset, is that they have this ability to navigate multiple complex contexts fluidly. That means they know when the trans language in an academic and a social, social situation, they can adapt to their home language and culture and then go to a school expectation. They've got it figured out. They get the system. They've been around a while. Many of them navigate work environments and home and school environments in multiple languages. You see them working with a a parent in a store, for example, and, and they're using Spanish when a Spanish speaker comes in and they're using English when an English speaker comes in. These students have so many assets that they are bringing to our classrooms. They have the multicultural, bicultural experiences that they can bring their lens to all of our lessons. So that's what you're gonna see when I go through these as an asset base on our long-term English learners or that subgroup. As Nelson Flores, Tatiana Klein, and Kate Mencken talk about in this article um, called Looking Holistically at Students Labeled Long-Term English Language Learners, they are not students lacking language, but emergent bilinguals with a repertoire that allows them to, to maneuver multiple languages and contexts in ways that are complex and dynamic. I added the parentheses around emergent bilinguals because I would suggest that many of these students actually are, we would say, bilingual. At what point do you stop emerging? Um, you know, when, at what point do we get to say I'm bilingual? So whatever your definition of your, your bilingual, um, I put the parentheses around those terms. That was not from Nelson Flores, Tatiana Klein, or Kate Megan. Um, so this is another asset-based view of who our long-term English learners are. 
we've just spent some time on this and I am going to look quickly at the chat. Um, understanding who is classified right now. I'm not seeing it. If you could just share out for me, Liz, is there anything else that's come up around this who is classified that you're seeing in the chat? There's one comment um, that Sherry, Sherry, thank you for your comment for dropping this in the chat. And I, I think it's such a good point. Um, what's the percentage of language learners that actually attain proficiency in just five years? I mean, I, as far as I know, and Sherry also says, the current research says seven to 10 years for academic language proficiency. That was my understanding that academic language comes as sort of like year six, seven, eight. So there's like a misalignment between these timelines and the developmental language acquisition timelines. So good point, Sherry. And I just wanted to let you know that she mentioned that and give you a chance to to speak to that. But other than that, um, that's uh, everything else that I'm seeing is just, um, there's a lot of yeses and thank yous and amens. So um, and people are definitely, what you're saying is definitely resonating. Um, great, thank you. And so, yes, this is where policy at the federal level in the United States actually created this subcategory because we know from a lot of the research coming out, like Jim Cummins, right? One of the godfathers in our field, where he's saying like five to 10 years to acquire academic language. And they're saying more than five, boom, you're automatically considered a long-term English learner. Um, what we are finding is that students who enter in kindergarten, for example, if they have not exited by fifth grade, that that is probably they're going to be into this label, this long-term English learner label. And what does that label itself mean for the students and what, um, what their programming is like? So um, you can think of three Ps, thank you to Mia Allen, a colleague of mine, these three Ps of policy. So that's the policy from our federal government saying, five, you know, after five years, you're classified as a long-term English learner. That's the policy. Then we have programming. Because of the policies, now suddenly we're throwing students into certain programs saying, oh, sorry, you're classified as a long-term English learner. You cannot take X elective because we need you in this English language development class. That's a programming decision. But now we're holding them back from maybe an AP literature class that they would thrive in. Or maybe they would do great in the AP math class or the advanced or the international baccalaureate, you know, higher level. They might do very well in that. But because of the label, our programming puts them in a certain category. But today, we're going to focus on that third P. We have policies, programs, and practices. That's what you do in the classroom. That's how we interact with our students. And that's where we're going next in the content objective, applying some strategies for ABCs of working with these students in your classroom. So that's where we're going to focus our attention is on that practice bubble. And I, I have bubbles. It's like, you know, the policies, programs, and practices all interact but I would like to focus on the practices here. So um, that's great. Thank you for your um, interactions here. We already did the first language objective of describing their characteristics in the chat box. And now we're moving on to um, asking and answering a lot of questions. We'll be using the chat boxes this as well around text. So let's look at the ABCs. Of all the things in this session, this is probably the only thing that I can claim as mine, is that I read lots of research, lots of papers, um, read several books, um, and all of those are on the Padlet that Liz has dropped in the chat box, and I think she'll do that again. And this Padlet does have a passcode, it's called LTEL, there's something creat creative and clever for you, but the Padlet has everything I'm gonna mention to you today. So um, as, as we go through, know that all of the research is there. And as I did all of that, I had to kind of figure out how do I put it all together? And I came up with the ABCs, but none of the research is mine. So the first letter A is amplify, not simplify. And this was huge for me in everything I'm reading. It's about amplifying grade level, complex text, content, really academic, grade level, interesting content, challenging content, and then thinking. Getting students at thinking at higher levels, not those simple questions anymore. 
And this is a shift for many of our teachers and where the label itself of LTEL often prevents teachers from doing the amplification. That in all goodness out of our teachers' hearts, they say, oh, they're a language learner, I need to simplify when actually this subgroup of students needs the amplification, and I'm going to show you what that means. They need more. They need the deep, rich, challenging content and thinking that is going to move their language and lift their language into higher levels. So that's the A. And we'll get one strategy on each of these letters because of our time frame. The B is to build literacy across content through collaborative structures. In all of the research that's out there, it's about literacy development and across the contents. Not that these students have a separate, here's your literacy class or here's your English language development class and then the rest of the day, there's no building consciously and purposefully building literacy. We need literacy in math, literacy in science class, literacy in social studies. That discipline specific literacy is best built in the discipline itself. So helping all of our teachers to be on board to support our long-term English learners and notice that collaborative structures, many of you had typed in the chat at the beginning that they're strong, that many of these long-term English learners are stronger in oracy. Exactly, we're gonna build on their strength. They can use multiple languages in oral language. So we're gonna build on that oral language to support their literacy development. That's the B, build literacy. And the C is connect. And again, this, this encompasses a lot of the research connecting to the student's background knowledge, connecting to their family, their community, connecting to these students' cultural, linguistic, and experiential assets in any ways that we can. And again, each of these, the A, the B, and the C, could be a whole webinar on its own. I'm gonna give you one example, one concrete takeaway that you can have for yourself or for any of the teachers that you're working with um, to support long-term English learners. All right, so that's the ABCs and let's jump into the A, amplifying text. So, how we're going to do this, I will show you a text from science. And in this science text, I'm going to have you just read through. And then we're going to talk about what ways could we amplify it to make it more comprehensible and accessible to our students. So here's the text and I'll be quiet. So Jody is already jumping in and that's with the question that I have next is as you read this text and Jody's thinking along as she reads, yep, showing a video, adding the images, um, what else could I do without changing a single sentence structure, without simplifying? What can I do to amplify this text? So go ahead in the chat. Yes, 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 Jody. Of course, I love See, Think, Wonder, um, one of the Harvard Project Zero visible thinking routines. Love it. Cornell notes are fabulous. Separate pages. Yes, a glossary, annotate, use visuals, imagery, underlining, bold the vocabulary, text features. Yes, chunking, paraphrasing. Yes. Um, so Jody, the paraphrase is an interesting one. Um, that I would say probably orally, yes, but I'm not going to change the text itself for them. I want them to see complex text. Thank you, Efren. Thinking pair share along the way so they can use that oral language strength. Um, super. All of these are right on. And I'm going to take all of those um, great ideas. And what would happen if I did that? Um, Lisa, nothing wrong with reading aloud. Absolutely, that's a possibility. 
and I want our students to be able to read on their own. The majority of our students who have been classified as long-term English learners can decode, the majority. There are a few, and we're gonna address that very briefly at the end because it was a question that came up about long-term English learners who are also classified with special learning needs. And some of them have missed some of like the phonics instruction. They don't have the basic skills to decode but the majority of these students can decode, but they may not understand what they're reading. Um, Chris Tovani, one of my Colorado colleagues, she has a wonderful book called, I Read It, But I Don't Get It. It's not specifically about long-term English learners, but the majority of the students she was working with in the high school when she wrote it were long-term English learners or former English learners. So the book's title is I Read It, But I Don't Get It. It's on the Padlet under books, and it is fabulous. What, what she found is that many students read along. They, they know how to decode, but when they hit a speed bump, um, like whether sitting in silence or erupting with violence, like they don't even realize that that's a metaphor, that's a speed bump. They just read right through it and don't really capture what's going on in their head. So she calls it like recognizing speed bumps. So we can do a lot on this to amplify the text. I'm going to show you what I did. It's one example and it's called engineering the text. And here's my example. What did I do? So in the chat, can you figure out the five or six things that I did to that text without changing a single word? Yep, we got it, Carrie. I did, I added some visuals, images, yep. Synonyms, nice, I added a glossary, added Spanish for some words, yes. There's a second language. Oh, subheadings, nice, cognates, I chunked it, yep. Um, added color coding, nice. Guys, this is it. This is called engineering the text. So what I did is added an infographic for the numbers. You would be surprised at how numbers throw off our students, especially because the numbers in the text are written out. You don't see 50 and 60 as a number, but as a word. So I took that and created an infographic that only 60 erupt every year. So it's a labeled infographic. Then you see over here the myth, the story. So I created the angry volcano. Um, and so these are two different kinds of images. Pictures are fine too, but for this purpose, I did that. Now you'll notice that I um, also used, sometimes I translated and I chose some words that were actually cognates because I want students to recognize cognates. So sometimes they have to see the cognate. So erupt and erupción, I may not hear erupt as a cognate to eruption. It just sounds different enough. Um, but if I see it, I can manage that it's a cognate, right? And then for some words like interested, intrigued, I just gave an easier word that I know that the students know. They, they, these are long-term English learners. They know the word interested. Now myths, I could have put mythos, it's also a cognate, but I also know they know the, sh the easier word stories. So I use that, but you could do it either way. There's no right or wrong on this. It's about supporting the students to be able to read independently if I amplify the text. I'd like to show you some other examples, but first here are, um, so some examples and you can see how other people have done it. I just taught this um, course for teachers in Colorado where I live. And this one comes from Tyler Crone. He's a middle school math teacher. And he chose this one. Um, yeah, of course, sorry, I'm seeing Justine. Cognates in multiple languages, absolutely. If you've got 15 languages, I usually have the kids find, is it a cognate or not a cognate? And we can even put that on the wall with all of the words around the outside and then they compare and contrast, is it cognate or not cognate? Anyway, so here's a very complex math problem. And he said the students just have struggled with it in the past. Check out what he did. And this is why it's a shout out. So he's got the situation, he, got, he has this. Tyler has not given away the problem at all. He's just put it into a context now that the students can see. He did the color coding and the words. He's pretty excited about the difference between using this version and the just the word version. 
Um, Melanie Sutton is an English language arts teacher here in Colorado, and she is having the students read The Outsiders. And as some background knowledge, they read an article about The Outsiders, and she engineered it. You can see very similar strategies along the way. These are some of the strategies that you can use to engineer the text. And these all come from Andrea Honigsfeld's book, um, Growing Language and Literacy. It's a fabulous book and it comes up in um, level four for students who have lit, hit that level four on the WIDA. If you're a WIDA state or they're into the bridging, almost bridging stage. So you chunk the text, you add guiding questions or headings, add a visual with captions, add a glossary within the text or translations, and leave a wider margin and enlarge or enlarge the text, right? So all of these are options, and here's the exciting news. The kids can do it themselves. So there's several reasons for this. Number one, they learn more. Can you imagine if I would give the students that science text and group one, engineered paragraph one and group two engineered paragraph two as a team and they had to come up with the visual for the volcano sitting in silence or erupting in violence and you know the myths if they had to do that themselves bam they are going to understand that and then together we put together the whole passage and read it they're engineering for themselves in a group teamwork um, I had a teacher in fifth grade. She was trying to make sure her students didn't end up as long-term English learners. And she had the class do this with text. They started requesting time to engineer their own text. They loved it. They felt so empowered that they had the ability to create the visuals, that they could create the headings. I know what question should we ask? What's the focus of this paragraph? The second reason you want the students to do it is that it takes a lot of time and we can't manage to do more than a couple, three paragraphs. It just is really a lot of work and I would not want to leave you with, oh my God, I have to engineer every text. No, you have to engineer a couple to give them examples and then turn it over to the students because we want to create independent learners and by showing them that you can create a question that focuses your reading you can add a visual you can um, translate or do a cognate for those key words that gives them the independence they need to read on their own so that's awesome um, questions about amplifying the text and of course it's about content and thinking as well liz has anything come up that i'm missing i'm looking at the chat now no, I don't think we're missing anything. Let me check the question area quickly. We have some questions that can be um, addressed towards the end. Actually, let's, let's take a couple of these right now. Um, sure. So the first is more of a comment, which I think is a great comment. Somebody wrote, I often wonder would our native English speaking students pass the English language proficiency exam? The results I'm speculating might highlight a need for additional linguistic support for many more learners beyond those who are identified as English learners, excellent observation, uh, in my opinion. In, indeed, and that's why these strategies, the ABCs of working with language learners um, for long-term, that the majority of your content area teachers jump on board with this. So what you saw for English language acquisition, or the English language arts teacher, the math teacher, these are all teachers I just worked with who have one or two language learners. And they said, this is helping all of my students. So they're not opposed because they see how it supports even um, your monolingual English students. So when Yara says, we have long-term academic language learners that are monolingual, I'm thinking you mean monolingual English um, and I absolutely agree with you and they can benefit from these strategies as well. Carrie, good luck. This is super fun. Give a couple models to your kids before you set them loose to do this on their own and I would suggest they do it with teams first to engineer a paragraph at a time. So here we are on to B, to build literacy across the curriculum through these collaborative structures. Margarita Calderon and Sean Slack wrote this book, Teaching Reading to English Learners in Grades 6 to 12. And again, while it's not specific to long, um, students classified as long-term English learners, it, it is meeting their needs. And the strategies in there are very much in line with um, what long-term students need. And one of the quotes says that collaborative text-based reading strategies um, 
engages students with text and rich discussions. Notice this focus on the discussion and collaboration. And why is that? It builds on the assets that they bring, that oral language asset, and then we build the literacy from there. So let's try one strategy here and to build literacy across the content through structured partner reading. Now, this is a basic structure that many of you have probably used at some form or another, but that is so highly powerful for students classified as long-term English learners that I have to share it again. Partner A would read the text, and it's usually a short chunk of text, a paragraph aloud. I would give both partners a chance to read silently, scan it before their first allowed read. Now they're gonna work with partners and I understand that this is COVID time. If you can't have them read aloud next to each other, if that's not uh, allowable in your school, if you're face to face, um, they could read silently and follow up with a question. If you're in a Zoom situation, put them in a breakout room, right? So that's okay that they can read to each other. Now partner B who was listening is going to ask a question make a connection or paraphrase what they heard in that paragraph. Partner B can also follow along so they can have the text as well. They don't just have to listen. Then after partner A and B discuss the answer to whatever question was asked or the connection or the paraphrase, they have a mini discussion about that paragraph and move on, switching roles. Okay, so I always give partner B a support card and the support card would look something like this. Partner B, you can ask a question that could be about a vocab word, a phrase, the key concept in the text. You could ask a clarifying question or a deeper question. It's up to you. It can be a right there question or a use your background knowledge question. Partner B, make a connection to the text. You can do that too. So you can connect to your personal life. You can connect to something else you've read. Maybe it's background knowledge that you have. And you may wanna ask your partner if they have a different connection. And then finally, partner B, you could summarize if you wanted or ask your partner if they have a different summary than you. All right, so those are the three things for your support card. How we're gonna do this in a webinar environment is that I'll be partner A. <laughs> So you're all partner B. And since I'm partner A, I'll read aloud. And as partner B, you get to choose. Are you going to ask me a question? Are you going to um, make a connection? Or are you going to paraphrase? It's your option. You can have your fingers ready. I'll read it. This comes from um, an article. It's a, it's a big document, actually, from Lori Olson called Meeting the Unique Needs of Long-Term English Language Learners, a Guide for Educators. It's also available on that Padlet under the articles section. Here we go. In most effective classrooms, student talk is more prevalent than educator talk and active student collaboration abounds. But LTELs typically are not risk takers in class. They need daily structured opportunities, invitation and support to share responses collaborate with peers and present ideas. Team building, an important tool, is particularly critical at the beginning of a semester. All right, thank you. Please add your question, your connection, or your paraphrase. paraphrase. Super. What does it mean to collaborate? Good one. What are strategies? Yeah, to build that community, positive relationships, um, team building. What do you mean by team building? Example of a structured opportunity. Awesome. How long should it take to team build? Why would they not be risk takers? That's great. Um, what would the structured opportunities look like? There are lots of questions on that. Um, Brad Russell, shout out to you. Hi, another Colorado friend. Why is student talk more prevalent in an effective classroom? These are all excellent questions. Let's take Brad's about the student talk. That is um, based on a lot of different research recently about um, teacher talk versus student talk and who's doing the learning is generally that person who's doing the talking. Um, so how do we turn more into student talk? And then about less effective classrooms is often in an um, environment of lecture um, environment where the teacher's doing more of the talking. 
then there was all there were all these questions about what does a structured opportunity look like what we just did and that would be that partner reading it's structured partner a partner b partner a partner b there are so many different collaborative structures out there um, there are protocols as well as collaborative learning structures or cooperative structures like from spencer kagan cooperative learning so many opportunities to get students talking that is structured the difference between structured and non-structured is this non-structured okay in your group go ahead and finish this talk about this and and then turn it in when you're done so in your group and what that means of course is that one person either does it all or they all work individually or they do what you know kindergarten teachers call parallel play um and so we're sitting in a group but we don't really work in a group we don't know how to do structured work and what i find in grade six through 12 is that um teachers are really good about having kids group work but there isn't a structure to it often and without that structure we don't build the language we don't have equity and often it's the long-term English learner who is not contributing equally to that group for whatever reason. And we can talk about that more as we see what that label might do for the student. So um, this is great. Yeah, so this is partner reading and it's super easy to do. And here's a shout out to an eighth grade math teacher, um, Elena Jones, who did it in math. She had the students partner read their word problem. And um, she was so excited about it that um, this is what she said. One person in each group read the problem to the rest of the group. The students then took turns summarizing what they heard or asking questions. After the groups had time to digest the paragraph within their groups, we summarized it as a whole class. And what she said is that um, the students did way better on understanding what to do with that word problem than any of her other classes. So she tried it in one group like to do a little experiment and this one worked so much better and she said it took an extra four minutes to have them do that kind of partner reading discussing and then sharing out that was it and they had such much better results um yeah processing time here's a shout out to scott kaya yanaga from hawaii he's a music teacher check this out he did the partner activity but did this partner playing so one student did the first four notes the next student did the next four notes and they went back and forth playing on their instrument and again he said the support was huge kids who could not necessarily have done that whole um line of music in the chunks they were successful um, so I just love that when people take this idea and they make it work for different content areas. This is a huge shout out to Taryn Yost and she's a middle school teacher who did that engineering of the text and partner reading. She put the two together and you just have to read what she said about the students and their success. I was proud and amazed at how much they comprehended on a text that was actually several years above their reading level. The whole activity brought about rich discussion and learning in a way that engaged students while still having them read challenging text. Yay! So just adding these couple of things and you've got students reading way above a level that they would independently read. And we didn't, we didn't easy five. We didn't simplify the text. We just engineered it and had them read with a partner. Yes, it takes time. Yes, it is slower, but it's so much richer. And there is a place for what Saddleback has, which is such a gift as the high-low books. Maybe that's for their independent reading or free reading. But this is what we need to make them, lift them into higher levels of language acquisition. Some students may want a question support chart, something like this. So when they're turning to talk to their partner or ask a question, they may need some inspiration of how to ask a question. They might be at that level and this would get them to higher levels of questioning. Um, so these are all ideas for supporting students in it. I'm looking at the chat about um, questions about building literacy across the content area. Um, I see that Diane has used partner reading with poetry. Yes, I absolutely need that when I read poetry. Um, and just having someone ask me questions, it brings back memories of my AP literature and this was 1984, so I dated myself, and you can see how this traumatized me. I read a poem, and the first question was, what um, features of the text indicated that the poem was about death? And my first thought was, it was about death? 
I had no idea. So um, yeah, I would have benefited from some of these strategies back then. So let's do the C before we close tonight. And that is to connect. Connecting to the students' background knowledge, their family, their community, and their cultural, linguistic, and experiential assets. Once again, full circle, we're coming back to the assets. Because this question was asked early and on and before the webinar started about the term long-term English learner, I thought I would share this wonderful framing from Doug Fisher, um, and he's out of San Diego. Um, but first about Maneka Brooks. She wrote, Dr. Brooks wrote this book, Transforming Literacy Education for Long-Term English Learners, Recognizing Brilliance in the Undervalued. Look what she says about this label. The conversation about labels is about more than just words. Labels impact the way in which educators engage with students and understand their needs and their abilities. Let me show you from Doug Fisher how that impact impacts our students themselves. And I'm going to take it out of the realm of language learner. This is a commercial um, for Colgate. And if I tell you this is a commercial for Colgate, what do you notice in the picture? Just type that in the chat. Yeah, what about the teeth? Yep, food in the man's teeth, his tooth, the man's tooth, yep. And parsley on the teeth, food in the teeth, a dirty tooth. Yes, he has something in his teeth. We're all like honed in on the teeth because I said it was um, an advertisement for Colgate. But if I told you that this was um, a public service announcement for um, hearing, for auditory supports, what do you notice now? <laughs> oh my goodness, Barbara, right? He only has one ear. How about that? So, right? Whatever the label is, draws our attention. And when we hear the term long-term English learner, are, are, is our attention drawn to the fact that there's something wrong with the student? Instead of, hey, they're just on the natural trajectory of learning language. They're just on a natural trajectory of acquiring academic English and they're in the right place at the right time and I have to support their academic language learning. They've been here five or more years so they are ready for this complex text with a lot of support. So what does that label do for us and how do we see it? Um, so this I just thought was fascinating because as Doug Fisher says, your perceptions as a teacher become the reality. Um, the student's reality. Sorry, I didn't need reality in there too, uh, twice. So the teacher's perceptions become the student's reality. And that's the power that we have. So if we're just focusing on the teeth or the ear, how about the whole child? And how about what their needs are across the board? And how do we learn that? Um, as Alexandria says, labels can become excuses instead of, hey, let's support them where they're at. So to connect, we really have to get to know the assets of our students classified as long-term English learners. And to do that, there are lots and lots and lots of strategies. I'm going to show you one that's pretty easy to implement, and that is some kind of survey in the classroom. Um, and this survey, these questions come directly from an article that is on the Padlet, and it's from the City University of New York in their um, program for emergent bilinguals and it's the framework for education or education of long-term english learners grades 6 through 12. and this article on the padlet is packed full with um, ways of supporting these students at, at the programmatic level so here are some shout outs to people that have taken this idea and created like a google survey and what i love about this one is that it got it has a link to the activities page on the high school activity page so that students they're saying hey get involved be part of our community and here's how you can be involved in sports and music and clubs and boom activity page what are you interested in that's a beautiful thing for our students to say get be part of our school community 
Um, here's another one that I just love. What's your seating preference? Remember when we used to have that where we were all together in the same room and could seat how we wanted? Um, and then I love this other one. How do you learn best or what's your favorite way to learn? And they give some check boxes as well as an other option. Here's another one from a teacher who's, I just, again, how brilliant. If I'm angry, please. So how do you treat me when I'm angry? Or what do I need if I'm angry? How about if you're proud of me, please don't shout out or please go ahead and tell me that. Or what, do you, what these are lovely questions because I have no idea how someone is. All those people I gave shout outs to, I ask if it was all right, if I use their work and shout it out. Um, so these are just ideas of how to get to know your students from other teachers who have taken that idea of a survey and gone even further with it. We are coming to a close here. Are there any other questions about this idea of connecting with students, experiential, cultural, or linguistic assets? We do have one question, and it comes from Bahia, who wants to know, um, relating to the Brooks quote, how do you engage with teams that are concerned with academic rate of growth and want to refer students with these profiles, often less than five years of English language development, to special education? Um, and this notion of special education has popped up several times. Um, and, and I just want to encourage everybody to sign up for next week's webinar with Orly, where we will be tackling the subject specifically around multilingual learners and special education and what is the process and what are the practicalities. Um, I think Orly will, will provide a lot of great insight around that. Um, Beth, I didn't know if you had anything to add or um, if we should just really encourage people uh, to come next week to hear what Orly has to say. Um, first, encourage them for sure. And the Office of English Language Acquisition at the United States Federal Government, so O-E-L-A, OELA, they just had a webinar last week um, by the people, Karen, Dr. Karen Thompson is one of the people that's really looking into just the statistics and what is this idea of this dual identified. So students that are classified as long-term English learners and now being identified for special education. So she's out of Oregon. And what Dr. Karen Thompson said is that in Oregon, I believe it's 25% of the long-term English learners are also classified as um, special needs. And there are some questions around this. And I, I, again, this is not my field of research, but some of the questions are, did the student have a disability early on that could have been treated and worked with and supported, but because they were a language learner that the school district said, ooh, we can't test for special ed, which is not true, but that may have been the, the attitude then. So they could have had an unidentified need and now it's coming out. The other option is, they get to this point in eighth grade, they've been in our system eight years and we don't know why and we don't know how to support. And so he said, must be a special learning need. So that's the other end. And I think um, researchers like Dr. Karen Thompson are attempting to figure that out. And that is a new field. And I'm super excited to see Orly Klapholtz next week. They're asking for the link in the box for that. Yes, we will absolutely get that for everybody. Yeah, and so that was, it. those are the ABCs to amplify those texts and thinking and content, building literacy and connecting with your students. This is the um, Padlet that um, has been dropped in the box several times with a password of LTEL. And I so appreciate all of you. And if you want more information, I have a, um, many courses. There's three of them. They're five hours each. Um, one is focused on reading, one's focused on writing, and one is focused on oracy for um, students who have been classified as long-term English learners. And you can find that at EnglishLearnerPortal.com. And um, you can sign up. These are completely asynchronous and self-paced, and they're only five contact hours but lots of information and support in there for you if you're interested. Um, and then finally, I would love to see some tweets. If you want to do a summary or a takeaway from the session, tag both me and Saddleback on that. I would um, love to connect with you that way. And I know that, um, Liz, we have some time just for some additional questions, if there are any on the floor. 
Um, yeah, a few minutes absolutely. Get- Let's first give everybody the information they need about next week's webinar. And in a minute here, I'll drop a link to our website in the chat so people who want to register today can register. But next week we have Orly returning. And again, she's talking about multilingual learners and special education. Uh, there are oftentimes so many questions around this. So, um, and she's a great resource. So we definitely encourage you to join us and this will be next Thursday. Also, don't forget, Saddleback has Hilo Books on a new digital platform. So if you need more information about that, we have an on-demand webinar on our YouTube channel that you can check out. So uh, don't be shy. You can email me, you can call us, or you can simply just check out the on-demand webinar for more information. Okay, now let's jump into some of those questions. Okay, well, Justine had a comment earlier about um, long-term English learners, the, the phrasing around that, and she said, you know, can't we just channel that as learning for the duration of our lives, for our English life, positive instead of negative? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, and just, um, you know, I, I absolutely agree with you, which is why I say I'm a long-term German learner. Um, I'm a long-term English learner, still learning new words. The unfortunate thing is that the label itself has come attached to all of those words that you guys put in the chat originally, like struggling, right? Or slow or low. So it somehow those words have come attached to the label. And if we, Wida, I just got a message from Dr. Ruslana um, Westerlund and um, Dr. Jen um, Daniels, and they said they are working at Wida on this issue of the label and this subgroup of students. So that's exciting. Um, I'm sure we're going to see more from Wida as well. There was a question about the conference. Um, it was a webinar from the Office of English Language Acquisition, OELA, and that's where I heard Dr. Karen Thompson's work on the percentages of students that were dual identified. Thank you. And then we have Kathleen wanting to know, uh, what is the citation for the idea that it should take seven to 10 years to develop expertise in academic education? I don't know that we have a specific citation. I believe that stems from the work of Jim Cummins. Is that right? Yes. So Kathleen, you would want to uh, Google um, Jim Cummins and academic English. Um, and probably those two things together would probably get you what you need. Do you agree with that, Beth? Yeah. And the updated version is somewhere between four and 10, that if students are coming to us in let's say third, fourth or fifth grade, and they are on grade level literate in their um, home languages, plural, if that's, if they are on grade level and, and they have that already kind of de facto bilingual education, they may um, exceed uh, the time frame, like they may move faster and within three to four years, we're seeing them pretty ready to be on, on grade level without any additional supports. But again, it depends on their background um, coming to us. And so actually the older learners that are already bilingual are moving faster on the trajectory. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we've got all the, oh, here's one from Evelyn. Um, so there isn't a state or a federal definition of a long-term EL, correct? I thought I saw somewhere that six years they were at six years they were considered LTELs. So this is um, defined by uh, on a per state basis, pretty much, right, Beth? Right. So the Every Student Succeeds Act from 2015, that's what I showed you that quote at the very beginning when we said, like, how would we say that in a shorter frame? Um, they said students who have not been reclassified within five years um, have to be ch charted. They have to be followed. And that's where the frame of long-term English learners came from. But every state in the United States has a different classification or definition based on the Every Student Succeeds Act. Awesome. Thank you so much. Well, we are just about out of time. I want everybody to know that the Padlet information um, and the slide handouts and all of the information that was dropped in the chat along the way, we will be emailing that out to you in our follow-up email. So if you missed it, uh, we will definitely get it to you. And also um, in that follow-up email, you will see information about our upcoming webinar next week. Uh, and you can certainly go to the website sdlback.com and click on webinar series and get the registration link there as well. 
Thank you so much for your time, Beth, and thank you to all of you for joining us. You can find Saddleback uh, on whatever your favorite social media platform is. We are there, so check us out, interact with us. Beth, I'd love to see uh, what, what the tweets are like right now. Um, there's a lot of positivity around the session. See, I knew people were going to love this, and this is super helpful. Um, and thank, thank you, you to all of you for taking time out of your day to join us. We really, really appreciate it. And once again, Beth, thank you so much. And hopefully we will see uh, everybody here again next week with Orly. Take care. Thanks all. Have a good one. Bye-bye.